Welcome to the FN Studios. This is Five Rounds. Ram Dean and Black with you. We are taking a look back at all the action that went down this past weekend. We're looking ahead to UFC Fight Night, which goes down in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And then we get to your Twitter questions. But we got to start with the UFC Fight Night that took place in Berlin, Germany. In the main event, the 185-pound weight division on display as Mark Munoz collided with Gegard Mousasi. And I know maybe a lot of people have no idea who Gegard Mousasi was going into this fight because he didn't look particularly good against Lyoto Machida, but Machida makes nobody look yep. good. And Ilio Latifi, uh, again, taking that fight on short notice. Uh, Mousasi played a very, very tentative game. He was not tentative in no. this fight with Mark Munoz. Absolutely dominant performance as he gets the first round submission victory, landing that rear naked choke, forcing Munoz to tap out. Uh, what did you think about Musasi's performance? I know you love it. Outstanding. That. Berlin, Brazil, tomato, tomato. Every fight is like a snowflake. They had 66 rounds booked on one afternoon. It was a crazy day, and that was my favorite performance. If that was a snowflake, it was one angry, violent snowflake that was in a hurry to put the night over. And man, he looks, you know, we know how good Musasi is. If you've been following mixed martial arts, kickboxing, the world of combat sports for a long time, this guy's been on your radar for closer to a decade. He's still only 22 years old, has 40 28, odd, 28. 28 years yeah. old, yeah. 22, that would be absurd. <laughs> 28 is pretty absurd, to be honest with you. But, uh, you know, we've seen him perform well as a kickboxer. We've seen his jiu-jitsu really develop. This one was going to be about wrestling. He looked very good defending. And when he posted up on that arm and had that matrix-like move to move to the mount, oh, fantastic. This guy's the real thing. And you have to imagine, Robin, when you go back and look at his performance with King Mo, where he uh, fought for the Strike Force Light Heavyweight title, King Mo was able to use his wrestling abilities to hold Musasi down. Musasi really couldn't get anything going in that fight. And that was four years ago. You have to imagine that he's been diligently working on his grappling or anti-wrestling skills for the better part of four years. That means he was 24 years old when he started working wow. on it. Now in the prime yeah. of his life, ready to take on all comers at 185 pounds. And, uh, you know, just to be able to do that against Mark Munoz... Uh, really speaks volumes about his skill and about his desire to be at the top of the 185 pound food chain. Yeah, King Mo was a fantastic wrestler in his development period, but Munoz is another level, no question about it. For him to be able to do that was a big statement to the world, to everybody at 185 pounds, this is my time and I'm coming, and man, he looks good. And where do you feel that uh, Musasi you know, fits in that 185 pound class. Uh, is he ready to challenge for the title? Uh, considering that he just lost to Leona Machida, who's gonna be fighting yeah. Chris, uh, Chris Weidman for that title at 100 and, uh, UFC 175. Is he ready for a step up in competition to face off? with the uh, you know possible ch champion, or is a fight with Michael Bisping or yeah. Luke Rockhold? Are those in the cards before he gets his crack in the belt? Rockhold sounds like a lot of fun, yeah. man. I'd definitely like to see that. Rockhold is super mobile on the outside. That one might shape up to be more of a kickboxing match, and I would definitely love to see it. We'll talk about it a little bit later, but across on the other side of the planet, CB Dalloway had a, had a great performance at 185 as well. So that division has really taken shape, and no question about it, Musasi is a top 10 talent in that division, and I think that performance puts him there as well. Uh, recently, we saw TJ Dillashaw become the new UFC 135-pound champion on the card in Germany. We had uh, the Brazilian, Yuri Alcantara, taking on Von Lee, and we saw how good Alcantara was in his fight with uh, Uriah Faber. Uh, many people believed he won that first round. Uh, wasn't, uh, Faber wasn't able to stop this guy. He went the distance. Alcantara is a finisher, yeah. 24 victories by way of stoppage, 12 by submission, 12 by knockout. Until Saturday night, he ended up knocking out Von Lee before the 32nd mark of round number one. It shows you how talented, how powerful, how dangerous the Brazilian is. Yeah, and it, in that first round against uh, against Uriah Faber, he looked explosive and dangerous and talented. You're just not going to finish Uriah Faber. Von Lee, not quite at that level yet. He's only lost to top guys. Top guys. That's why he got this shot. But definitely, both Al Alcantara and Sun Sauer both sitting there at the top, ready to fight TJ Dillashaw. But TJ Dillashaw just looked so outstanding against arguably one of the best in the world. So that division as well. Man, a lot of good fights coming down the pipe. Uh, you talked about C.B. Dalloway. He battled uh, George St. Pierre's prodigy and Francis Carmont at 185 pounds. And to be honest with you, going into this fight, I mean, I, let, let's just say over the last year, I wasn't too impressed with C.B. Dalloway. He's a guy that just kind of fits in with the lower level of UFC fighters. You know, you, you're expecting to see, okay, a certain level of talent. And that's what, in my opinion, what we got from C.B. Dalloway 
except for the last year. We've seen the improvements yeah. that he's made. He's really coming into his own right now. And I think he's uh, t sending a message to the rest of the 185 pound division. Do not count me out. Uh, you know, whether it be the next year, year and a half, I will challenge for the middleweight championship of the world. And he looked like a world beater in this fight with Francis Carmont. Uh, you know, Francis Carmont knows how to slow down the fight yeah. and get a victory and maybe not make it the most exciting fight, but he knows how to win. CB Dalloway was not going to let that happen on Saturday. That's how he's been fighting. He's been fighting with total belief in himself. And really, he, uh, he has a loss in his record to Tim Boach that I think he won, which would put him at five wins yeah. in a row. You know, five wins in a row at 185 pounds is very legit. I think he just entered the top 10 as well. But we'll see, man, because Carmont just looks to be right on the I edge know. there. You know what I mean? He won those fights, didn't make a lot of fans in winning them. In this one, he had really good moments where the right hand was cocked with a direct line to CB Dalloway's chin, and he just didn't fire. If he landed one or two of those, the whole fight's different. So Dalloway performed amazingly like he has been, and we talked about this going in, into this weekend. Keep your eye on this guy. You know, this whole world of converted wrestlers, you know, from the Matt Hughes days, they were beating everybody. And then people came along, really raised the level of takedown defense, uh, defense against the cage, lifted that up. And now Dalloway, and he's on that, Phil Davis would be arguably the other guy. They're on the front end of really making a statement that the converted, redeveloped, new era wrestler are, are the guys to beat. And, what, I, and I guess Chris Weidman, of course, comes from that background too. Of course, what I really liked about this fight is we kind of got to see everything. We got to see scrambles. We got to see the guys use their strikings with their, with their hands. We saw a lot of kicks. We saw the wrestling. We saw wrestling. Uh, we saw takedown defense. We really got to see it all. And I think that's what, you know, when you when you go into a fight, you, you anticipate something. You anticipate maybe a dull matchup between Carmont and this, this fight with uh, C.B. Dalloway that it would be kind of lackluster. It would be either Carmont pushing C.B. Dalloway up against the fence or vice versa. For these guys to switch it up and showcase what they're really made of and their full skill set, you know, it's very, you know, I think it's refreshing for fight fans. Yeah, and there were two fight cards in the day. And you got a regular life. You got wife and you got kids. Maybe you got a job. You did something Friday night. You got something to do Sunday. That's a lot to ask of people. And when you watch these, you don't know which ones. I mean, only real heavy duty combat sports fans. People who identify them and part of who they are as being a combat sports fan, only they are going to be able to watch 22 fights. But when you watch them, everyone is individual. Everyone is unique. What would you rather see? That quick, dominant, Win, uh, finished by Stipe Miocic or 15 great minutes by two rising stars like that. And you talk about Miocic, uh, the Ultimate Fighter Brazil finale went down, obviously, in Brazil. Uh, the main event, Fabio Maldonado taking on Stipe Miocic. And I think people were excited about the idea of this fight. Oh, Maldonado, he's a guy that throws down, doesn't ever look for the takedown. Miocic, we know that he has a wrestling background, but he's been lighting it up, you know. He took it to Roy Nelson in his fight, earned a victory there. How will this fight play out? Well, a little bit lackluster, considering Miocic was able to get the stoppage in the early stages of round number one. I think disappointing the Brazilian fans, but Miocic looked very, very good. The question is, should Maldonado maybe drop down? You look at his, his body, not really... The, it's not, not very, focused on conditioning. Exactly, right. not yeah. focused on conditioning, which you should be in 2014. Yeah, you know, we've talked about this a lot before. You got, let's say, 20 hours, 22 hours of physical training that you can do. If you're Maldonado and you love lighting guys up and you specialize on, on attacking the body and you still need to shore up your takedown defense, that can take up so much that you don't have the physical and mental energy to commit to that. You look at Maldonado and you get the feeling this guy has the skeleton to fight at 185 pounds. Miosic is a big heavyweight, like a big heavyweight. You know, not the biggest of the big, but just as a dude yeah. walking around, the shoulder structure, the skeleton, the jaw of a heavyweight. So you step in there with that, you know, where really are you going to win that fight? You can't dance from the outside because we saw how good Miosic looked against big country on the outside. You can't wrestle with this monster, so you got to step into the pocket. You step into the pocket, and a big clean left hook almost finishes him yeah. off the top, and then he enters again and just turns the knuckle on the right hand. You know, a, a two and a three, simply Simple and clean, and when you outweigh a guy by that much, and your skeleton, your mass is so much bigger, that's all it takes. Uh, 170 pounds was also on display. Damian Maya welcoming the Russian Alexander Yakovlov, and uh, Damian Maya doing what he does best, fighting very intelligently. And uh, I think 
you know, what, what you take away from this performance is that the Russians are legitimate. You know, taking on a top guy like Damian Maya, who kind of has his back against the wall, losing in his last fight to Rory McDonald, and he was very, very competitive. Yeah, we also had two great, uh, tough Brazil winners. We'll talk about those guys in a future thing. We're going to talk about a Russian in the next segment. But listen, Damian Maya, I heard some criticism of this performance. I thought it was masterful. After wasting all his energy and over uh, committing in round one against Rory from the, from the mount position, he played a brilliant Brilliant mount through three rounds, really controlled, looked fantastic. When we come back to five rounds, we look ahead to the UFC that goes down this weekend in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Welcome back to five rounds. UFC fight night, Habilov versus Henderson goes down in Albuquerque, New Mexico this weekend. And what a great main event to the lightweight division on display. You have the former WEC and UFC lightweight champion taking on one of these dangerous Russians. And Habilov, 17 and one in his mixed martial arts career, his only loss coming against a 205 pound fighter and it was a split decision loss so working at uh, Jackson Winkle John you know the guy is going to be prepared because Ben Henderson is just one of these weird guys that knows how to get it done he's physically imposing he's intelligent he's creative and I think it is going to deliver exciting action for the fans yeah this is a really really cool fight this is a cool fight from a technical standpoint because you really don't know exactly how it's going to go and nobody's really solved Ben Henderson. Sure, arm barring him and kicking him off the cage is a type of solving him, but I mean in general, managing how he moves and how he manages the fight. And these Russians with this, you know, combat sambo background and Kabalov, uh, uh, combat Sambo world champion, a masters of sport in hand-to-hand -hand combat pancreation. When we were in Russia doing the world combat games, we met a guy from Dagestan and we were like, oh, you're competing this weekend? Yes, I am competing. And what, which style are you competing in? We'll see. Well, no, like which type of martial arts? Whichever. Because he may, now there might have been something lost in the translation, but generally some of these guys will compete in four, five, and six different disciplines throughout their development uh, period. So when we see these combat sambo guys now, people are like, wow, they've moved like a uh, mixed martial artist. They are mixed martial artists. They've been doing five styles of fighting their whole career. And that's why there's so many Bogatina fighting for the, for the title right away. So many of these guys moving up to the top. But uh, for Ben Henderson, this is a guy that knows how to win. Uh, he can take the, you into deep, deep waters, and I think that's one, where the area, one of the areas that he shines. His conditioning on par with some of the best fighters on the planet. Uh, he never slows down, and I think his creativity is what sets him apart from most at uh, 155 pounds. Uh, what are the keys to victory for the Russian? What, did, what does he need to do considering, uh, you know, you look at Ben Henderson's style, and it's... it's it's very difficult yeah. to, to figure out. Yeah, I like the way you put that because it isn't like what are the keys to victory for either guys. The keys to victory f for Kabalov is to solve Ben Henderson. The keys for victory to, for Ben Henderson is to just be Ben yeah. Henderson. That's how he wins fights. So I think you need to see Kabalov coming in from the outside and landing on his way in. We've seen uh, Nurmagomedov use lead uppercuts a lot to gain entry. Maybe Kabalov can do that, move out on angles, hit once, move on an angle, hit again and leave. I mean, TJ Dillashaw just made that the flavor of the month, that mobility-based striking, but I think that's the way you try to beat Ben Henderson too. What you don't do is stand in the pocket with him, you don't spend time wrestling with him, and you don't stay on the fence because somehow, even in those very close fights, judges see things going his way. Maybe it's his body language, maybe it's the fact that he pays no respect to anything you do, but he wins decisions, man. Another very exciting matchup, one of the most exciting fighters, I think, in recent memory. Uh, you look over the last decade, Diego Sanchez always showcasing heart and skill and desire. Uh, he's going to be in tough taking on Ross Pearson, who's again hitting his stride right now, known for his striking abilities, but has shown improvement in the anti-wrestling or anti-grappling uh, realm. Will he be able to stop Diego Sanchez's relentless pursuit of the takedown? And will he be able to handle uh, how, how Sanchez kind of overwhelms his opponents? Yeah, this is fun too, you know. And uh, hey, you ever see a boring Sanchez fight? Never. Like ever? Yeah, have you ever seen one? And this wouldn't be one either. But the big question here, Ross Pearson has been a guy who stands in the pocket to fight. He has, you know, he's, he tucks that big British chin and he fires big counter shots. Uh, he's a bit left hand reliant. If he doesn't throw the left, he, he rarely throws the right. This is 
is on paper a great fight for Sanchez, but Pearson's last fight was a no contest, I think, to Melvin Gillard. Yeah. And before that, Ryan Couture, he beat him. That feels like a long time ago now. But Couture played a game of super mobility, staying on the outside, kicking the legs, staying away from him to get him to chase. And it looked like it worked. It worked for a round or two. And then when Cub Swanson beat Ross Pearson, it was the same kind of thing. Does Diego Sanchez approach it that way? Or, more importantly, I think we might see the opponent, Pearson, actually take that on a little bit. When somebody's been able to beat you or challenge you using something, you look at it sometimes and go, I want to try that. I want to get good at that. So we might see Pearson play a mobility game against Sanchez. And if he does, I think we'll see Sanchez drop his third in a row. But more likely, we see 15 minutes in a very close fight. Uh, Diego Sanchez, you know what you get when it comes to the nightmare. Is he still the nightmare? I think is he's he the, the nightmare dream? again. I'm calling him the nightmare. He had a dream that he was the nightmare. And the, the fact is, he's called the nightmare because if he gets that takedown and he unleashes his ground and pound, you want to wake up from this terrible, terrible dream <laughs> yeah. with this guy on top of you, training in New Mexico, and he's not going to be tired, training alongside Havilov, who's getting yeah. ready for Ben Henderson, going to be peaking on the same night as the guy who's in the main event. And I just don't know if Ross Pearson's going to be able to handle the pressure that Diego Sanchez puts forth. Yeah, and all those points you just made are probably the points to make, uh, make him, uh, Diego, the uh, favorite. You know, this is a cool fight. It's a cool fight on paper. It's cool to see what Pearson has added or changed because you know he'll be a different fighter, but all of those reasons you just made, you got to go with Diego Sanchez as a bit of a favorite. Uh, 125 pounds also on display. John Dodson taking on John Moraga in a fight that I believe will be one of the fights of the night. Both of these guys, very, very talented. And John Dodson, you have to imagine, both of these guys want another crack at Demetrius Johnson and the 125 pound title. What do they need to do? Is it as simple as just getting a victory, or do they have to show the crowd that, look at, I am the number one challenger yeah. at 125 yeah. pounds by, you know, ending this fight with an exclamation mark. Yeah, Maraga has got the tougher assignment here because what he's got to do is corral the little crazy man, get a hold of him, get a body lock on him, put him on the fence, and that's going to be the tough assignment. Yeah. I mean, you've seen this guy doing flips off cages and stuff. This guy's out of control. He moves very quickly. If Dodson can, can play that game, he's playing a game that it's sort of another test. Can you handle Demetrius Johnson? If Dodson exploits that, then the answer for Maraga is you move back down a little bit and you work your way back up, and the answer for Dodson is, holy crap, we'd like to see these two bumblebees going at it again. So uh, and this is a fun fight. I think Dodson right now is probably the guy in a better position to win it, but if Moraga gets a hold of him or lands a nice hard punch, he can change everything. A lot of great fighters on the card. Eve Edwards, uh, one of the pioneers of uh, mixed martial arts, a guy that helped grow the sport over the last uh, 15 years. Also on the card, Sergio Pettis, the possible, I, I think, the future of 125 pounds, do you agree? Yeah. He's at 35 still, oh, I right, believe. Right. But, but he's supposed he to be fighting at yeah, 125 I, this, pounds. This was an interesting one. I haven't had a chance to ask Duke why he's at 120, 135. He has fought at 25. That would be a great place for him. But they feel 35 is the place for him. He has one win and one loss, but looked good in both yeah. UFC fights. Another tough assignment for him. Super creative. If he settles in mentally into this one, he's going to put on a show. Sergio Pettis, I think... Uh, a guy to watch out for considering he trains alongside his brother, one of the pound for pound best in Showtime, Anthony Pettis. And Duke Rufus, obviously one of the best coaches in mixed martial arts. It is going to be a solid card coming from Albuquerque, New Mexico. When we come back to five rounds, we are getting to your questions. Welcome back to Five Rounds. It is now time to answer your Twitter questions. The first question comes from Ohio State fan 86 who wants to know, is Mark Munoz still relevant or is he a gatekeeper? Yes, I know he's lost a couple of fights. Who are they to? Well, the current 185 pound champion in Chris Weidman, the, beat, the man that defeated Anderson Silva, not once, but twice. Also, f former 205 pound champion, Leota Machida, as well as Gegard Mousasi, the former uh, Strikeforce 205-pound champion. 
You lose to those guys, that means absolutely nothing. You also have to remember that Mark Munoz has victories over Damian Maya, CB Dalloway, Tim Boach, and Aaron Simpson, and Chris Lieben. So the answer is yes, Mark Munoz is still legitimate. This guy can compete, I think, with the lower end of 185 pounds, whether that's number 10, 9, yeah. 8, 7, 6, or 5. Yeah, and you know what? You call him a gatekeeper if you like for a couple of fights, but people's memories are, are razor short. He has one or two brilliant performances, and we talk about that is a little blip on his thing and don't you forget what this guy did to Tim Boach. Andy in Montreal wants to know Lawler, Matt Brown, who you got? Outstanding question. It is going to be one of the most exciting fights of the year. I, everybody knows that I have a certain love for Robbie Lawler. He's old school. He's gritty. He hits hard, can take a punch. Very rarely do you see this guy in a boring fight. Matt Brown, almost the same, but I think Robbie Lawler is going to be able to exploit the body shots that we saw Eric Silva land on uh, Matt Brown in their encounter, and I think he's going to be able to take him out in the first or second round. Yeah, well, that's an interesting one because the 60-hour week analyst in me looking at it technically goes, yeah, Robbie Lawler all day, beautiful counter right from the southpaw stance, nice mobility, but you know what, man? Matt Brown, you got to weigh the intangibles when someone's as special as Brown. Intangibles are a real thing. Heart, guts, will, gameness, chin, recovery. This guy's got it all. I'm going to go with Matt Brown just for the hell of it. MGM90 wants to know, is TJ Dillashaw one of the pound for pound best in the world right now? I love TJ Dillashaw. I took out Hennon Brow in spectacular fashion, but we had a conversation about your, your guy Alex Ricci and his first fight for Substance Cage Combat got hit, rocked in that first round and said, I just was not able to recover. People said he was gun shy. He was gun shy because he didn't yeah, know where he was. Us. Is that the case with Hennon Brow in this fight with TJ Dillashaw? Do these guys need to rematch in order for him to be considered one of the pound-for-pound -pound best? I don't think they need to rematch, although I would love to see it again. But I think Dillashaw needs to go out and dominate somebody else. Although the other argument is, if you beat the man, you become the man. And he beat a guy we were just arguing was he either pound-for-pound -pound number one or two. I beat him. That's got to put me there. But TJ Dillashaw, take nothing away from that absolute brilliant performance. He is the number one bantam bait weight in the world. But I want to see him beat another top guy. And I want to see him dominate again. What does pound-for-pound -pound mean? We all believe that John Jones is at the top of the pound for pound heap. Uh, number two, is it Jose Aldo? Was it Hennon Barrow? You know, it, right now, it's such a ridiculous question, but it's one that for some reason people are interested in. Yeah, this is pound for pound the best MMA show, I'll tell you that. <laughs> that is it for us. This has been Five Rounds. Next week, we look at all the fallout from New Mexico and look at all the action that is going down at UFC 174. Bagatinov and Johnson.